Thank you all for joining us today for our endourology CME event. Uh, I am Amy Cranbeck from Northwestern uh, University, and it's my great pleasure to introduce a dear friend, Dr. Kershid Ghani. He is a professor of urology and co-director of the Endourology Fellowship at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Ghani is a globe trotter. He did his uh, grad his undergraduate degree at the University of Leeds. Then he got his master's of surgery from the University of London. In 2011, he was awarded the Urology Foundation Scholarship and uh, did a fellowship in robotic surgery at Henry Ford Hospital and um, has joined the University of Michigan starting in 2013. Dr. Ghani really doesn't need an introduction. I think most of us know who he is. He's authored over 200 peer-reviewed articles. Um, he's a, the foremost authority in lasers and laser lithotripsy and has extramural funding for the study of laser and its effect on human tissue and stones. Um, he serves as the director of the Michigan Urologic Surgery Collaborative, the Music Collaborative, and also has multiple hands-on courses and educational courses for laser lithotripsy. So we are really excited about his presentation today, and um, I look forward to hearing about the differences between home and family. So take it away, Dr. Ghani. Thank you, Dr. Krambeck, and thank you to the team at Northwestern University for the invitation. Uh, thank you to the chair, Dr. Schaefer. This uh, is, I think, you say, I'm the first speaker in this series, so uh, I hope to do it some justice and, and, and begin on an exciting topic. Uh, Dr. Krambeck asked me to speak about holmium versus thulium fiber laser, uh, when to choose and how to use, because you know, laser lithotripsy has evolved now where we have multiple laser platforms and and sometimes, you know, we may be in a position to choose what we want, but sometimes, you know, we'll work in a hospital and that is the laser that's there. So I think it's very important in the modern day for us to understand how these lasers work and how to use them appropriately and how to get the best results out of it. So that's the goal uh, for the lecture today. Disclosures, uh, I have consultant activity with uh, a few medical device companies, uh, and in particular, Boston Scientific uh, is, a, is a company that has funded some research at the University of Michigan uh, by myself and, and by my partner, William Roberts. And so some of the research from respect to Holmium and will be uh, part of that grant, scientific grant. Uh, and I think the most important thing is that on a, on a daily basis in my clinical practice, I use both a Holmium laser and a Thulium fiber laser. They're both fantastic platforms. And I've, you know, I'm, I see when I wanna use one versus the other. And I hope to teach you about that today. So today, when you have a laser and you have to decide what you would choose, it's easy to say, oh, well, I'm going to choose this one or that one. But when you start to make it personal, you start to think, you know, what would I want in a family member who's going bladder stones? Should I, would I want them to have a holmium laser or a thulium fiber laser? Because there are some limitations of, of each of these uh, platforms. What about a stone in the lower pole that you want to treat with a mini PCNL and use a laser to do that? What would be the most appropriate uh, laser for that? Or what about an impacted urethral stone in the CEO of your hospital? Which laser would you think is the best one suited to do tackle that safely? And in, and lasers these days have now evolved from the gold standard Holmium uh, YAG system to the Thulium fiber laser that was uh, uh, developed and released a couple of years ago. There are multiple uh, lasers on the market. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And, and more recently, there is the Thulium YAG, pulse modulated Thulium YAG, which has come out in Europe and it's now here in the States. We don't have a ton of um, clinical data on that. So for the purposes of this talk today, I'm just gonna focus on Holmium YAG and Thulium fiber laser. Modern laser lithotripsy, what do we want? So we want to be able to do our laser lithotripsy um, effectively. We, we want to be able to do it um, uh, with good speed. Uh, we want good results for, for patients and um, we want it to be safe. Uh, these are important uh, a trifecta of outcomes that we're looking for in, in the modern day. There's no point being fast if you're not getting great stone-free results. There's no point being fast 
and being stone free, but having injuries and hematomas and so forth. So let's talk about the aspect of speed. And one thing that's happened in the last decade is the uh, increase and in, um, especially in the United States about the use of high power lasers for laser lithotripsy. Uh, and in this systematic review from uh, Dr. Traxer's group in France, they looked at some of the outcomes. There's very limited studies comparing high power and low power holmium lasers. That's the first thing you need to understand. And in the limited sample that we have, there were no real differences in stone free rates between high power and low power. And I would probably agree with that. I, I think maybe that might be the case, but there's so much heterogeneity when you look at different studies. But the major finding is you can see in the in the in the chart here is that the high power lasers, uh, it had a significantly uh, lower operative time than a low power laser. And, and that is the observation that we've seen in our institution at University of Michigan, where definitely we feel we're much more efficient and faster with high power lasers for largest kidney stones. I don't think treating a four millimeter stone in the ureter, it's going to matter whether you have a high power or low power laser. So this is really around the ability for us to tackle more complex, larger stones ureteroscopically. And as we all know in the, in the US, time is money. Every second that we're in the operating room, that is money. And so if we're able to be more efficient, we might be able to get an extra case or two more cases added on on that day. And then if we think about safety, safety is a really important aspect, of, especially with the with the increase in high power lasers. And this is a, a field notice that Olympus had to issue in 2021, uh, not so soon after they had, they had released the thulin fiber laser because there were reports of thermal injury in the ureter because of the use of the thulin fiber laser with inappropriate settings, and we'll come to that later. So it, you have to be really mindful now with, with these really sophisticated lasers, what settings and what strategies you're doing so that you are safe. And this is a recent report that uh, looked at uh, a single case of a life-threatening bleed requiring uh, um, uh, a, a embolization after a ureteroscopy and laser lithotripsy for a large stone using high power settings and the thulium fiber laser. And this is not something that we're used to seeing in the modern day with ureteroscopy and laser lithotripsy, thinking of cases where that need emergency embolization. We, yes, we may have seen some hematomas. So what's going on here? And so I think this is yet to be fully unpacked, but I do think appropriate setting use and mitigation is really important. So for stones, how do you choose a laser? If you get the option to choose, how do you choose the one that you want for that particular job? Because you have to understand the differences so you can select the right laser for the right job. And if you have at that particular laser, how do you use it well? So you need to select the appropriate settings and strategies so you get the job that you want to uh, be done safely. And so, in the next section, I'm going to speak about the, these next generation lasers, whether they're homium high power systems or pulse modulated homium systems, or whether they are super pulsed thulium fiber lasers. And there are so many different uh, uh, systems now available on the market. And more recently, we have the thulium YAG pulse modulated system. So a lot of sport for choice, but what are the differences between these different uh, platforms? So let's just look at Holmium versus Thulium fiber laser. The Holmium system is a, uh, you can see here that the wavelength is uh, 2120 uh, and versus the Thulium fiber laser, this is lower wavelength. And that um, gets you in terms of the differences around water absorption. So with Thulium fiber laser, high water absorption. So that in many ways means you have to be quite on contact on, when you're with the laser fiber on the stone. The optical pulse profile, what does it look like? With a homium, it's like a shark. It's got a very big spike. And whereas with thulium fiber laser, it's got a very long pulse duration. It's very smooth and symmetrical. And we'll look at some graphs in a minute. The big thing with the thulium fiber laser is the ability to dial down the pulse energy to very low pulse energies and the ability to increase the pulse frequencies to really high frequencies, such as 2000 and, and beyond. And with the homium system, the current up, uh, state of the art system, the highest hertz that you can go to is 120 hertz. And then you can see the differences in pulse duration. Uh, homium has a lower pulse duration. Thulium has a much longer pulse duration. We'll see what that means later. 
And then one important differentiator between the two systems, and I find this really important, is the size of the laser fiber. The smallest laser fiber uh, currently available right now with the thulin fiber is 150 on a routine basis, 150 uh, uh, core fiber, which is really flexible and actually can be really helpful in scenarios in, in the lower pole, whereas the home, we're all familiar with what that uh, size of the laser fiber is. What about the advances in holmium laser lithotripsy? So uh, there's been the development of the pulse modulated system called MOSES technology. It was developed by Luminous and it's now sold by Boston Scientific. It's a splitting of the pulse. Uh, so you get two pulses. MOSES distance mode is one of them, which is what you're seeing here on the vid video. MOSES contact is a different mode where the pulses are split slightly differently. But in MOSES distance mode, you get the symmetrical uh, splitting of pulses. First a big bubble and then a second big bubble. The advantages of pulse modulation with holmium is it reduces retropulsion, it increases fragmentation, and especially fragmentation at distance. And we did some work when the uh, MOSES system came out and we looked at uh, in the laboratory uh, firing the laser uh, on a stone in a controlled environment uh, and we tested the different pulse modes, the short pulse duration, long pulse duration. We tested the Moses contact mode and we tested the Moses distance mode. And don't be confused by the name. W although we use the distance mode, we kept the fiber in touch with the with the actual with the actual laser fiber. So what we found is you can see on this graph here that the Moses distance mode led to 30 percent more fragmentation than any other mode, and that was profound. So there is a mode in homium laser lithotripsy that will give you more fragmentation. And that's that's great, it means you can break the stone faster. And that's one of the major advantages that I see in pulse modulation and why I use the Moses system. The other thing about the other Moses mode called Moses contact mode is it, it really it's different from Moses distance. Well, you can see here, these are, uh, are, are artificial stones that were broken down with the different pulse modes, Moses contact, long pulse, Moses distance, and short pulse. And, and all the same energy was applied, standardized experiments. And you can see that with Moses contact, you're able to get really precise fragmentation. Uh, there isn't obliteration of the, of, the, of the planes on the stone, and you can really drill perfectly. And that's there's something special about that splitting of the pulse that gives you very precise fragmentation. And so I know that from the work that we've done here at Michigan. And as a result, I'll select that mode at moments that I want to be really precise. And I don't want collateral damage to the urothelium or areas like that. A big uh, difference between the holmium and the thulium fiber laser is peak power. And that is the fundamental difference. Of course, their wavelengths are different, but as a result, there are differences in peak power. And I want you to think about peak power as a, as a karate chop. I want you to think about it as a punch. And so it's either a weak punch or karate chop or a strong punch or karate chop. So this is an optical pulse profile of the Holmium laser, and it has a high peak power. So it's got that big spike and then a quick tail. And the very, it, these uh, pulse durations for homium vary from 100 to 300, 400, 500, but, but often no more. They do vary depending on the pulse energy used. This is the Moses uh, split pulse that we talked about. Its peak power can be somewhere between 1,500 to 2,000. So it's got a lower peak power than the standard pulse. And that's that reduction of the peak power gives that, that gentleness to maybe do some dusting. And that's why the Moses system is pretty good at dusting, but if you compare it to the thulium fiber laser, you can see the thulium fiber laser has a much lower peak power. It's around 500 watts, but it's got a really long pulse duration. And that long pulse duration can have advantages, but it can also have disadvantages depending on the mode and, uh, and the settings that you're using. And why does peak power matter? Laser lithotripsy is more than dusting. I have uh, been a massive a uh, fan of the dusting technique. It's more or less most of the time what I do in the kidney, in the ureter, I do a combination. Sometimes I'm just fragmenting. But we, when we're breaking stones, and the lithotripsy, the actual term means to crush the stone, we are often fragmenting. We may want to 
crack it if it's impacted. We might want to dust it beautifully. We have to be able to tackle all different types of stones, cope different scenarios. We talked about in the very beginning all the different scenarios that you might want to treat a stone with a laser. It has to be safe, you know, no strictures, no pain. Um, it has to be effective in all locations. And very importantly, the technique needs to be standardized. And I'm glad to see, you know, there's some residents from Northwestern. And so training with these lasers are really important so that technique is standardized. And we're lucky that we've had many decades to train on the homing platform and standardize those techniques with the legacy old watt systems. But with the high watt, we've developed schemas and rules about how to treat stones. But thulium fiber lasers, brand new. And so we're still as a field trying to understand what is the best setting and, and things like that in terms of standardization. But peak power matters because it's the peak power, high peak power that allows us to do the cutting and, and the fragmenting versus the dusting. So let me give you an example. I, I teach and I say, look, Holmium is like Bruce Lee. It's, it's, it's got a high peak power. And this is an example of an impacted stone in the ureter using one joule Moses mode. And it's just cutting and smashing the stone and just breaking it up. And sometimes that's exactly what we need to do. We don't want to chip away. We want to chop it up because we, that, that's the goal for that particular scenario. Thulium is different. Thulium is soft punches. And on the right hand side is not Bruce Lee, is my daughter. And she many years ago was learning karate. And this is a video I found a long a while back. And I thought this is perfect because this just shows the issue, which is thulium's got very low peak power. And you can see here the clinical video, one joule short pulse mode, and it's just giving small, small chips. It's not cracking. You saw how one joule on the other in homium cracked the stone here. It's just chips, which is exactly what we are. We're not able to break through, but eventually you will, but you have to chip away. So thulium has low peak power. What what is the data comparing these uh, two systems? What does the laboratory data say? This is a, a table that summarizes some of the key papers that have looked at holmium versus thulium in the laboratory. Uh, most of the studies but were done by uh, the group in Russia when they were developing the thulium fiber laser with IPG, uh, a couple of other studies from Dr. Traxer's group, and of course, uh, the pivotal study from Hardy and um, uh, Dr. Freed, who had done a lot of the basic science and development around thulium fiber laser. And, and you can see that they've done studies have used either real human stones or fake stones. They've done handheld methods, uh, different experimental systems, different outcomes have been assessed. But the major findings were always the same, which is thulium fiber laser was really good and better, better fragment, better ablation, faster, 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 faster. And that faster rate varied from time two times faster, three times faster, even four times faster. So the excitement in the field was that this thulium fiber laser is going to come out and it's just going to obliterate holmium and we're just going to be two, three, four times faster. And we'll discuss shortly around some of the clinical data, whether that's been the case or not. I'm going to pause now and just do a little bit more of a deep dive on thulium fiber laser and peak power and pulse duration with some work that we've just done in our lab at Michigan and we presented at the AUA. One of the things to look at is the optical pulse profile of thulium fiber laser. I showed you what those uh, profiles look like. So let's just look at here. This is a one joule um, short pulse in red and a one joule long pulse in blue. So you can see that short pulse, shorter pulse duration has a higher peak power, makes common sense. So and that's around 500, but long pulse, the peak power is, is low, it's 200. So it's just, you're just elongating, same energy area under the curve. And so you can see long one, one joule long pulse in blue and one joule short pulse in red. And we looked at the optical profiles and we characterized this, and this was work done by our lab fellow, Dr. Maron. Uh, but what was surprising for us is that when we looked at three joules short pulse, and we compared it to one joule short pulse, the peak power does not change. So you go from one joule to three joule, you don't get more peak power. And that's that's not how homium has been. You go from one joule to two joule homium, you get higher peak power, you get, you get more, you get more to chop. But here, 
all that starts to happen is just the pulse duration gets longer and longer. So that's a really important finding when we when we looked at this in the in the lab. Th I wanted to show you this because it's come up a lot with where do you use short pulse or do you use long pulse when you use the thulium fiber laser? In Holmium, it has been advocated to use long pulse, and and the reasons are less retropulsion with long pulse, um, maybe you know nicer uh, fragment quality, definitely gentler uh, on the fi fiber tip in terms of burn back. But here, if you look at this graph, this is the stone to fiber distance. So you've got the fiber is right right on the stone, which is zero, or it's three millimeter away from the stone, and you can see that short pulse when you do a single pulse on a stone you can see the greatest ablation with thulium comes being on contact and it actually has a curve just like homium as the millimeters you get away from the stone less and less ablation but look at long pulse duration significantly lower fragmentation and literally nothing happening at two millimeters or three millimeters so it's clear if you're going to use the thulium fiber laser for for fragmentation it, you should be using the shortest pulse duration because the shortest pulse duration with thulium is still really long compared to homium so this is one joule long pulse in green you can see here very little ablation happening but one joule short pulse in red so what does this mean what does this mean clinically so it's it's what it means is that the low peak power of thulium fiber does not crack it just drills and it's almost like cheese you'll be just drilling holes in the stone and this is an impacted stone in the ureter uh, that we're treating with one joule of energy and it, it won't crack it you have to be patient the technique with thulium fiber laser is different and we'll cover that later so it's just like cheese and you have to be patient and and be mindful of the energy that you're putting in, not get frustrated and increasing the power. We'll talk about that shortly. So it's got low peak power and it's difficult to fragment. It's great for dusting. So that's a scene from Back to the Future. Uh, my uh, current, our current fellow, Dr. Andrew Higgins, you know, we, we made a wonderful video on homium thulium. This is from that video. We actually presented that at the EAU in Milan. And this is a clip from Back to the Future saying, you know, you, you, you don't have power because you're on water. And so when you're struggling with thulium fiber laser and you're like, I am not cracking, I'm not cracking. The, the, the default, you know, just like with homium, it's increase the power, give me more. And I would tell you, you've got to be careful there. Let's look at that. So this is data from the lab that we presented at the AUA, where we now are looking at the fragmentation, the, the crater depth uh, on the left hand side, and we're comparing one joule short pulse and three joule short pulse. So three joule short pulses in red. And if you increase the power from one joule to three joule, remember, you're not going to increase the peak power. You can see that you don't get an increase in crater depth hardly significant and if you're working on an impacted stone you're looking for forward penetration crater depth you're looking to fracture and make your way through and, and and clear your way so that's really this is quite a unique and you know we it hasn't been a lot of single pulse experimental data with thulium fiber laser and this is the work that we've done in the lab here and this was really eye-opening for us so where does all the energy go? So when we look at crater area, what you see is, yes, you do put three joules of energy. There is more energy going in. The energy goes that way. It goes this way. And so you're not going forward. You're going that way, greater surface area. And that would be fine in the kidney, but you have to be careful in the ureter when you do that. And this is maybe, you know, why I feel that there were reports, and this is that safety recall with thulium fiber laser, that you know there were reports around uh, impacted stones in the ureter being treated with thermal injury, and uh, folks used too much high power. And my hypothesis is they used the high power because they were frustrated with the standard settings, which were lower power, because they're not cracking through the impacted stone. So I think impaction can, with thulium fiber laser 
is problematic. It can be done. It requires awareness and technique changes and patience, but you need to be mindful of that, especially around strictures. The other thing about the thunin fiber laser is that there can be a lot of carbonization and flashing, uh, and that, I, in my experience, is worse when you're using higher power settings, definitely worse when you're using the long pulse duration. And you can see in these videos of 10 watt settings, 15 watt settings, 30 watt settings, there's still carbonization, and it can also be stone composition uh, dependent. So that carbonization can be off-putting, it can slow you down a little bit, and, and you know, if that, especially that's occurring in the ureter, you've got to be careful. But that's why I don't use a lot of high power when I use the thulium fiber laser. So let's just look at the, some of the uh, recent clinical evidence on thulium fiber laser and homium. And I'm just going to focus on the level one data. So just the randomized control trials that have been done to date. The first one that was published came from the group in Russia, uh, Dr. Martov, and they compared a 40 watt thulium fiber laser against a 120 watt homium system, uh, around 87 patients in each group. They just did ureteral stones. They used 10 watt settings. They used one joule and 10 hertz. Stone sizes were roughly equivalent. Their primary outcome said that it's the ability to effectively treat the stone, but they don't define what that actually means. But then they list a series of secondary outcomes, at OR time, laser time, complications, stone free rate, retropulsion. I've, I've, I've summarized just a few for this table, but, and they found better in all domains, thulium fiber laser. But in my mind, I don't think the study clearly articulates the, the, the endpoint, the primary outcome endpoint. Dr. Ulberg and colleagues did a study from Norway where they compared uh, patients with a 60 watt thulium fiber laser state of the art with an older 30 watt homium laser. And they found, and their primary outcome was clearly defined, it was a CT stone free rate at three months. They looked at both ureter and kidney. They found ureter no difference, but in the kidney, they found that thulium fiber laser dusted and you know got better results and we'll talk about that in just a, in a moment and other things they found uh, OR time was faster with the thulium fiber laser complications no different and more recently uh, Dr. Haas and Dr. Nakada from University of Wisconsin have have done a, a randomized trial uh, with the uh, Moses platform versus with thulium fiber laser and they didn't really find any differences uh, in, in this limited study so but we'll we'll unpack that in just a minute so these are the three RCTs that have been done, all limited in terms of uh, in terms of uh, patient cohort size. So, is thulium fiber laser better than homium for kidney stone dusting? Let's unpack the the data from uh, the Ulvig randomized control trial that was published in European Urology. They, as I said, they did CT complete stone free rates for renal stones. They compared it to a 30 watt homium. And the 30 watt homium got 34% stone free in 39 patients, which are not great results. 60 watt thulium got 66% stone free in 36 patients. So, so significantly better, no doubt. But is that a com fair comparison? And if you look at a recent uh, series that was published from Italy, a group in Italy, Peretti and colleagues, they did similar thing. They just did a homium laser uh, and they just did a 120 watt system they did just kidney stones between one and two centimeters, and they they found CT in every one, 69% was stone free, complete stone free. So no, if you ask me, if you do a high power homium versus a thulium fiber laser, I would say maybe those results are similar to what you're getting with high power homium. So in my mind, based on unpacking some of the data, I don't really see a significant difference in stone free rate based on that study. And it's clear that the study from Norway was, was comparing state-of-the-art thulium fiber laser with an old legacy homium platform that they're not going to perform in the same manner as a higher power system or a pulse modulated system. So really the study I think that needs to be done is the, a pulse modulated system like Moses technology versus thulium fiber laser, and it's been done. And, and it was just recently published in the journal of Urology. 52 patients with Moses versus 56 patients with thulium fiber laser, a mixture of kidney and ureteral stones. The endpoint was clearly defined. It was an OR time difference of six minutes, meaning the ureteroscope time. It concluded that between in these patients with this mixture, quite heterogeneous group, I, 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 yeah, you can see that they were there were no differences. And 
But what about the stone free rate? Overall, they found no differences in the stone free rate. So they didn't find what uh, Dr. Ulvig and colleagues found in that prior study. There were no significant differences. Uh, but if you look at the data a little bit more in detail, if you look at where I feel where I, where I feel the differences are around usual stone treatment. And if you look at the data in a little bit more detail with the Moses system in the 20 patients, 100% were stone free, but with the thulium fiber system, 94% were stone free. And in this limited sample, there was not statistically significant. But if you were to run the same trial and you had 226 patients with urethral stones in each arm and you got 100% versus 94%, that would be statistically significant. So I would say that so far the data is is mixed. I don't see that one is better than the other from the limited data. And I really think we in the field need large, high, you know, well-powered uh, multi-center trials comparing indeed an, a pulse-modulated homium against thulian fiber laser. So Dr. Krambeck, uh, on that point, you know, um, I can pause here and if there are any questions or people have any uh, thing that they want to ask me at this stage, I'm happy to to just take a break and have any questions from from the folks in the audience. Well, I, I have a question. Um, in the Nakata trial, what were the standard settings that they were using in the ureter and the kidney and with the Moses 2.0 and the thulium? Yes, so the settings should be on the table, and it was 6.4 watts. Uh, it was a standardized, you know, I think it was 1.2 times 6 or something like that. But it was 6.4 watts for, for the ureter, and in the kidney, it went up to 24 watts. Okay. And this, yeah, and so they tried to standardize the settings, and the criticism could be that, well, the settings are different with one versus the other, so you shouldn't standard, you know, you should. My view is, you should have a trial and say, look, here's your laser, use it to the best of your ability, the way you know it's best and just go for it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. keep them safely and don't box people into like zones, right? They'll just be pragmatic. But but I understand that they, they tried to say, look, we'll just use that much energy and this much energy here and there. So that, and you can see the mean stone sizes between the two groups. So they really didn't unlock the dusting capabilities of 2.0 with those settings, you know, that you can do with the homeum. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think there's great variability in how we all do these operations, right? So definitely for urethral stones, we're all trying to keep the power down and be safe and, and exactly. you know, but, but with the kidney stones, you're right. I mean, I mean, I am, I have the luxury of a system like Moses 2.0 in one facility where I can go up to 120 Hertz, 100 Hertz. And for those big stones, that's faster. I I I, I see that because when I go to the other facility and I and I'm max to 80 hertz, I, I notice it. You know, it's mm -hmm. like five ten minutes less, right? And so you get to see that. Now, is that profoundly game changing? I mean, that's for an individual surgeon to to determine. You know. Okay. And then another question I had is, do do you sometimes like? you look at a stone and you see, oh, I'm going to use the thulium for this, or I'm going to use the homium for this, or is it really just based on what's available for you at the location where you're operating? I am, I have, so I'm very mindful that I'm spoiled where I have, when I operate, there isn't competition for the lasers that particular day. So I do get to choose, you know, and they're both in the room. So I do preoperatively decide. We'll go through and say that's thulium, that's homium, that's thulium. But where I, where, where, you know, ureter, um, well, and I'll show the strategies is often uh, thulium, I mean, often homium for me. But sometimes, if the stone is mobile in the ureter and not impacted, thulium is is great. Um, and I and I definitely have zones, and I'll cover that when I do what for what in the next section. But one area in terms of stone composition is the calcium phosphate brushite stone. I do think the thulium struggles there. And I do, if I see that, you know, I'll definitely ask for the homium, but we don't know what composition the patients have, right? Unless they're a known stone former and you know from their prior surgeries. Uh, and so, and I've, uh, yes, but one area that I've noticed some of that struggle is if I'm doing my PCNLs and then I have to bring the laser in to tidy up, you know, uh, you know, a stone in a calyx with a, the flexible scope, 
and now have a calcium phosphate. So we, we, we notice that the thulium does struggle there. Okay. Yeah, it's it's funny because, you know, we're, we're looking at trialing thulium and potentially purchasing and, and the administrators are always like, well, why, you know, why can't you use one for everything? And why, you know, why would you choose one over the other? And I, I personally can't give a good answer as to why I need two different ones. Um, uh, so it's it's kind of hard to make that justification and to, to present a sound reason as to which one you want to use when. So that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously the big advantage of thulin fiber lasers, it's, it doesn't require that, you know, the, the plug, the high power ampage plug, it's it's mobile, it's quiet, it moves around. I absolutely get that. And from a from a scheduling, you know, on call and you're trying to do cases, you know, it's it's great. But remember, on call cases, you're not doing a 15 millimeter kidney stone dusting uh, as a add on. Right. And you're trying to get into some any random room. You're doing a urethral stone and urethral stone. I think with thulin fiber laser, there is a learning curve and there is a nuance to doing it. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. Are there any questions in the chat? Because, you know, I can't see the, the teams, but and is does anyone want to ask any questions? If not, I'll move on. Uh, there actually is a question in the chat. Um, Dr. Paramal, uh, for TFL, does 0 0.5 joules in 10 hertz equivalent or is it, is it equivalent to 0 0.5 joules and 30 hertz? So, so with, yeah, so with TFL is 0 0.5 joules and 10 hertz the same as 0 0.5 joules and 30 hertz? No, uh, you're going to get more because you've got the frequency, right? You're going to, it is more, there's more energy, right? 0 0.5 and 30 is more than 0 0.5 and 10. But you're just going to get more chipping, right? Just faster chipping. But sometimes that's not going to help you in that scenario if you're impacted. You're not going to be able to crack it, you know, and I'll cover some of the settings for that might clarify that. Do you change your use of sheath, your rear access sheaths, depending on what laser you're using, or are you consistently? Yes. Impressed? Yes, that is that is what has changed for me, and it's all in the next section. So it's a great question, and I'll and I'll cover that because I think thulium fiber laser or a very excellent dusting system has some profound advantages in the kidney. Shall we go then? Okay. Yes. So how do you choose? So this is my schema. And of course, we're learning and nothing, you know, we're early days. So let's talk about kidney stones. If the stone is a big stone in the kidney, well, I know that I'm going to likely stent this patient. So if I'm going to stent the patient, I'm going to What's the harm in using an access sheath as long as it doesn't injure the ureter? And I, our access sheaths are 10, 12, or 11, 13. So I don't use large sizes. Everyone in my schema gets a preoperative alpha blocker, but for seven days. I do find that helps. The ureters are much more compliant. And if it's a big stone, my feeling is holmium, high power settings with high flow irrigation is fast, it's rapid, it pulverizes the stone. I'm placing a stent anyway, that's when I will say I'm using a sheath, I can use high flow irrigation, I can use high power settings, I'm mitigating any heat generation from high power because I've got tons of flow, I've got great outflow, that's my schema with sheaths and home. But if the stone is small in the kidney, an eight millimeter stone in the interpolar location, in an asymptomatic patient, that they're asymptomatic, but they're worried about the stone dropping one day. They go, or they have to go somewhere on a vacation, whatever. These are the cases in my practice that I have changed where I'll go in, again, I don't place a sheath. I go in and I will dust the stone with the thulium under low power settings with no high flow irrigation, gravity irrigation. It is a little bit longer. It is a bit of a stop and start, but the goal is to dust because the thulium fiber is fantastic for low retropulsion. It is really fantastic for low. So if you're patient, you can get it into really fine sand. I don't place a stent. And those cases are 
sort of my boutique cases now and then the patients wake up and they don't have any discomfort some of them say some of them said to me like did you do anything to me i can't feel anything except that you know the discomfort of the, the urethra but my flank doesn't feel like anything and i think there's something there about about that toning down the flow and taking it a bit more gentle but so that's my schema for renal stones and i'll show you some cases for urethral stone if it's impacted i'm using holmium and i'm using low power settings if it's if i feel it's not impacted and, and mobile and how do you know sometimes you don't know and that's why to, to dr Krambeck's answer sometimes i'll say okay we're going to use a thulium a homium because it's a urethral stone i go in i'm like oh this it's not impacted whatsoever get get out the thulium fiber laser because it does really well and the, the advantage of dusting in the ureter is you don't have to use a basket i don't use a basket so but often the just a simplified schema is urethral stones are often often impacted they're, they're stuck right that's why they haven't moved and so holmium is my go-to for that so how do i use these uh these lasers a little bit more detail so there's an example of a 1.2 centimeter lower pole stone uh, <clears throat> i'm using an access sheath i've got the moses 2.0 system i'm doing in situ laser lithotripsy uh i'm using the moses distance mode because it's there's constant movement right you're brushing and moving around so if you're one or two millimeters away inadvertently you're using a mode that's giving you a little extra fragmentation and it's giving you more fragmentation when you are on contact i hard stone i might be using 0.3 joules and in this particular case i had 0.3 joules and 120 hertz dr cranbeck just talked about those high frequencies but i'm using 24 to 36 watts in that initial contact phase but i've got high flow irrigation I see the access sheath. I know what's dripping. I can I can feel if there's any. I don't use room temperature. I, mean, I don't use warm fluid. I use room temperature fluid. So that's my initial schema. I I do other nuanced things. I place the patient in Trendelenburg, and you know that helps with sort of mitigation of some of the fragment uh, moving around the kidney and, and things like that. But in the same case, now that the next phase is pop dusting. And pop dusting is different to contact phase. Contact phase, you're constantly moving and sculpting. With pop dusting, it's different. You just stay still. You find the exact sweet spot and you do intermittent bursts of energy. And in this case, I'm using 0.5 joules and 80 hertz to, to just get those pieces smaller and smaller. So you can see that I've sort of dose escalated. I've gone now to 25 to maybe 40 watts of energy. And for those who've not done this, you just need to build yourself up. Maybe all that you need is 0.5 and 50, 0.5 and 40. So you need to work out what's right for you in that particular calyx, what you feel comfortable with. But the goal is stay a couple of millimeters away from the calyx your wall. Don't get too close because you don't want to have any contact because you don't want to um, have any bleeding. And at the end, I will flush. I will flush the lower pole. So this is inside your laser lithotripsy. The angle is not terrible. I'll flush and as I flush, I come out so I can try and get the fragments coming out. And, and then I look at the fragment size against my laser fiber tip. Is it no, is it double the size of my tip, the one size of my tip? So I try and get a size size estimation. And I'll, as I mentioned about flushing, and I always ask the anesthesiologist to give 10 milligrams of furosemide just at the end. So to promote that diuresis. And that's my that's my strategy here. I did have a slide on the CT of this particular case. I presented it at the AUA uh, last year and the post-op CT scan, no fragments. Um, this operation, the operative time was really low, in and out, very straightforward. So just to recap, when I'm using the Holmium, especially with the Moses system, I'd use uh, the pulse modulation with Moses distance. If you don't have pulse modulation, that's fine, but I, I do dose escalation. But for the Rachel Stone, uh, I keep the power less than 10 watts and I'm often using a fragmentation approach and if I have the Moses system I use Moses contact mode because it's precise and it will cut the stone as I wish. So when do I use Holmium or high power Holmium on uh, platforms for urethroscopy? Large kidney stones, dilated systems because you don't get great pop dusting with thulium fiber because of the low peak power so if you have a tight calyx you'll get good pop dusting but if you've got a larger calyx you're not so that's a sign for me if i don't know that they're dilated i'm like okay i'm going to use holmium here if the stone is hard to reach because the the absorption with thulium fiber laser is so much that 
you don't get that reach as much and you get that reach with then so you've got to so the lower poles always a is a, is a tricky one because sometimes you you know you just can't get onto the stone with thulium you can create that energy to sort of hit the stone and then the stone comes towards you uh definitely if i'm using a usual access sheath i'm using high flow irrigation high power settings and and it's fast and this is our series of 29 patients and our mean or time was 30 minutes and we had great stone free rates 79 percent zero fragment but i <coughs> excuse me i caveat that they're not all ct scans they're pragmatic imaging Homium for impacted urethral stones is my go-to. This is an example of a 15 millimeter stone. I'm doing at one joule and six hertz. I keep the energy low. It took us 19 minutes of lithotripsy time and total OR time 42 minutes. And that's that's pretty good. I remember in the olden days, this would take me much, much longer. So what about thulium fiber laser? First thing, I I use the 150 fiber because I want better flow on low flow gravity states. And so you can use the 150 fiber. I started to use it. I got really frustrated because it's so fine. It would get stuck in the working channel and not get through. So I got a trip, tip from Dr. Traxer itself. He said, cut the tip. So here it is, cutting the tip with the, with the scissors. It allows now the fiber to go through the working channel much more easily. It doesn't get stuck. And it also allows you to see the tip better because it's such a fine fiber and you're fighting through a lot of dust. I start with no sheath. My go-to setting is 0.2 and 50, so 10 watts of energy. On the other pedal, I have 0.4 and 30 or 40. And um, you know, you can see it, the vision's not great because I don't. I have gravity low flow, so I have to stop and start. We just be patient and we just get it dusting. You get fine fragments. It's slow, but there's a goal here. I didn't place a sheath. I'm not using pressurized irrigation. And at the end, I don't leave the patients with a stent. The other area I find thulium fiber laser excellent for is endopapillotomies, especially, you know, patients who are, who, you know, we, we do that here at Michigan. Uh, you know, we have a series of patients that, that they find benefit. And, you know, I know the, the data on this can be controversial, but, you know, we have patients who you do this and they actually, their pain goes. And so we find the thulium fiber is perfect for soft tissue. There's no, not much bleeding. And I've been doing these now I don't play stents for the endopapillotomies. So my settings are somewhat similar. Um, and again, you can do these stentless. But the major limitation is impacted ureteral stone. So this is a nine millimeter stone in the left distal ureter with semi-rigid ureteroscopy, setting of one joule and four hertz. I've been using that setting that Dr. Gupta in Mount Sinai recommended doing one and two. I think one joule and two and four hertz is it's excellent, but you don't you don't fracture through. You drill. There's a different technique. You've got to nudge the stone off the wall with the scope. And we do that with thulium too, with homium as well. But this is the technique's different. You have to be patient. It takes much much longer. It took us 33 minutes of lithotripsy time to do this. And I I would say if I had homium, I would have done that in 15 or 20 minutes. So. It, it is different and here in our you know i do train the residents to use both because in the future you don't know which laser you'll have you'll have some systems have one you'll have some systems have others so i think it's important that we all learn how to use these ones and, and develop strategy and schema but if you get to choose you will decide which one you like so when do i use thulium fiber laser it's for dusting small kidney stones i use the 150 fiber I don't use an access sheath. I use gravity, low flow irrigation. I do low power settings. It's excellent for endopapillotomy in the select few pa patients that require that. It's great for a difficult lower pole because the flexibility of the scope now is profound because you've got a 150 fiber, but beware. You might get onto the stone, but you may just not be able to reach it. And so that's, that's it. You just don't know until you do it. And so sometimes you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, but definitely the flexion is fantastic. And, and I, like I said, it's slow, there's a lot of dust, vision is an issue, but it allows stentless ureteroscopy. So I'm wrapping up and this is my take home messages for Holmium. High power lasers have increased speed of fragmentation and operating room time. Holmium has a high peak power versus thulium fiber laser has a low peak power. The MOSES uh, platform with the pulse modulation, it splits the pulse. MOSES distance mode leads to more fragmentation. MOSES contact mode pr provides a more precise fragmentation. 
the, I use the dis Moses distance mode for kidney stone dusting. I use the Moses contact mode primarily for urethral stone fragmentation. I find holmium high power and especially pulse modulation is ideal for large kidney stones that you have to have an access sheath and you can treat it. It's fast. Holmium for impacted urethral stones, it is the Bruce Lee karate chop. You get through and it helps disimpact and you can make it through and I find that really important. In the ureter, whether it's holmium or thulium, I tend not to go above 10 watts. Um, you can go up to 12, you can go up to 15 if you've got higher irrigation rates, but in general, the rule that we teach is less than 10 watts. Thulium fiber laser. The lab data shows thulium fiber laser significantly better in terms of fragmentation, but that's, in my opinion, that's not been translated to the clinical world. And I think there are a lot of factors there. So some stone composition issues, there's flashing issues, there's carbonization issues, but definitely what we've seen in our lab and our cl my clinical experiences, use short pulse, not long pulse. And what we found is that higher energies do not necessarily increase the depth of penetration uh, in terms of single pulse data that we've we've unpacked. In my practice, thulium fiber laser is a great dusting laser, but it's ideal for small kidney stones. For me, for me, uh, I use the 150 fiber for that, for gravity irrigation, no sheath, slow. And I would encourage you, if you have a thin fiber optic scope, you've got no trauma to the ureter, do these cases and leave them stent free and you'll be surprised, it, it works a treat. Thulium fiber for the kidney, these are my settings, 0 0.250, 0 0.430. For urethral stones, it will not fragment easily, it just chips and dust. Eventually it will crack, but you have to keep chipping those holes to create the crack. It's completely different. I call it the Swiss cheese uh, uh, um, type of style. And then my settings for urethral stones are here, one times two to four, 0 0.6 and four, 0 0.6 and six. Uh, and then each laser has distinct mechanisms and purpose, and you just need to be mindful of that and learn how to operate in a safe way. So I'm gonna close and just wrap up on, on something lighthearted. And you know, we are, I'm in Michigan and my wife actually works for General Motors. So we are a, a GM family. We have tons of cars and always get cars uh, left, right and center. So these are our, this is our, uh, our current system. So we have, my wife has a big, uh, Yukon, I have a small little bolt, you know, and lasers are like cars in the family, you know, in my mind, you know, each car has a different purpose. So if you think about a big family trip and all this luggage, where's, which car are you going to use for that? And this is the, 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 the small car, you can't fit in all the luggage, but this is the large car. What you going to do with all that junk, all that junk inside the trunk? You can go camping, you can go all over the place. So. There is something about that, but there's also something nice about having a smaller car that's nimble and can go to places. So it's something like that with lasers. They're like cars in the family. And so in my mind, that's the Moses system. And then this is the thulium fiber laser. I wanna just, uh, two more things. We have a meeting every year called the Dust Symposium. This year it's August 10th to the 12th in Napa Valley. Uh, the website is dustcme.com. If you like lasers, you like stones, you like techniques and tricks, many wonderful faculty uh, teach on this course. And so hope some of you are able to attend. We'd love, love to see you there. And then, you know, all the work that I present is, is a huge team effort. Uh, we have, we're fortunate to have an endurology research lab here. Uh, it's directed by my partner, Dr. William Roberts. And over the years, we've trained many fellows, lots of, lots of good people. And our current fellows are, are Dr. Andrew Higgins, Dr. Becker, uh, Dr. Galena Fernandez, who's helped me uh, with this talk. So thank you to Galena and Dr. Ron Marin, who's done a lot of the single pulse recent experiments with thulin fiber laser. So thank you to the team. Um, I think that is it, uh, Amy. I, I entertain any questions and comments. Well, I thought that was an outstanding, wonderful presentation, and you really made it clear. Um, Personally, I'd rather park your Volt in a Chicago parking garage than, <laughs> than the big vehicle. <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's a good thing. Um, so I, as I was watching you talk about when you choose thulium and when you choose homium, it's almost like when you would choose shockwave. 
you know, like, um, cause I do a little bit of shockwave here and there. It's usually that, you know, solitary stone in the kidney, um, not impacted, you know, that you think will pass. Um, yeah. or if you have like kind of a loose looking stone in the ureter, you know, yeah. that would be one as well. So do you still do any shockwave lithotripsy? We, we do in the, in the, of course, in our institution, the unit, I personally do not, uh, but there are a lot of parallels, right? I, I've looked at some of the shockwave data about the higher the hertz, like the more breakage you get, but also side effects, right? So, so you're you're right. I, I, dusting has always been in to me has always been intracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, right? And where we now need to go with is stentless, but you can't do stentless not yet with these large volume stones because you're worried about you can get the fine sand, but you could get a Steinstrasse, just okay. like with Shockwave. We've seen it all. So you're absolutely right. So when I think those stones, I just feel it's faster and quicker because thulium fiber laser, I think it just is a bit longer because everything you're chipping off is fine. So it takes longer. But maybe, you know, you know, I think we just need more data. But I think it's still a fantastic platform for the right. For me, I, I've created that decision making process. But I think others will decide different methods and I'm looking forward to seeing what other people think. I have to just say there was a very good paper from the Duke group on what is the ideal settings and I think we don't know and they they gravitated to one joule, one joule, you know, and up to 10 hertz and I agree. I do the urethral fragmentation and I'm at one joule. One joule is what worked and I think maybe high maybe the bigger stones, maybe we should be doing one joule and 20 hertz with thulium fiber laser. So that might be something to, to explore. Interesting. Um, and then um, I just have one other comment, which was the papillotomy. So Dr. Wolf does still live on at your institution, right? <laughs> he does. Wolf and Farber, yes, they yeah. have paper and uh, yeah, and the patients still are here, right? So yeah. they, they're like, yep, it's time for my papillotomy. And I, I have to say when I took a you know, when I got here and I was doing some of these patients, I would do the papillotomies with holmium. They would bleed. That's what I was going to say. They bleed they would quite bleed. a bit. And, they would, and I would never leave them stentless. I was scared. I was like, once if the bleeding leads to a blood clot and they get colic. So I'd always play stents. But since I've been doing thulium papillotomies, it's, it's profound. Now, the other area about thulium fiber laser, I think if you're asking, like, why should we get what for what? Upper tract urethelial carcinoma, game changer. You know, really? I don't use home name anymore. Game changer. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, um, that I, I will definitely try the thulium on the upper tract papillotomies and the TCC. So um, I do quite a bit of homium. In, well, I don't do a lot, but I do some homium in nucleation of bladder tumors. Mm. That seems to work very well. And it, the settings I use for that is what you use for pop dusting. So okay. it's like 0. 0.4, 50. Um, and it, it enucleates very well, but I've not tried the thulium. You're saying you've been enucleating with the homium to yes. enucleate. Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But for upper tract, I, I've heard that about the thulium for upper tract tumors is very well. So. Yeah, and I've done an up, I've done a couple of upper tract urethelial cases. You go up, you know, the blade, and you come down, and there's like a few small papillary tumors in the bladder. Use the same 200, you know, 150, 200, mm -hmm. and just buzz them. It's it's great. You know, you don't have to open the bug bee anymore. Awesome. Okay, well, I'll try that. Well, I thought it was fantastic. I learned a lot and I know everybody on the call did too. And it's recorded. So we'll, it will be replayed multiple times. So thank, thank you. you so much. And I look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Cranbeck. Thank you to the Northwestern team. Okay. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.